Okay. Recording in progress. It's so Got personal it. when they say that, right? <laughs> hey, everybody. This is this is Ed, and this is Ted Russell Camp. Uh, Ted, I want you to tell everybody a little bit about who you are um, and where you came from, and then we're going to get into some different things after that. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Well, my name, as you as you said, is Ted Russell Camp, uh, and I'm a professional musician. I've been living in Los Angeles for about 20 years. Uh, in fact, I just had my 20 year anniversary in town like a month or two ago. No, I uh, but I'm from New York, grew up in the suburbs of the city, went to college right. in New York. Then I moved to Seattle for about five, six years. Then I came to L.A. Uh, and I've, I've I've been a mainly a bass player. Uh, more, you know, in the last 15, 20 years, I started kind of really getting serious about songwriting and producing. So I've been putting out a bunch of my own records. I do some solo tours. Sometimes I tour with a band. Um, the way we met is that, uh, for about the last 15 years, I've been playing with Shooter Jennings. Awesome. I've been playing bass in the band with him, written some of the songs we do. Uh, he's a wonderful guy and we've toured the United States many times over. Yeah. Uh, gone to Europe personal. a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's a great, it's a, it's a great team. It's a great band. I really right. believe in him and the music that we all make together. Right. So I got, yeah. I got, I got to tell you something, Ted. When I listen to your music, it, you know, I, I mainly listen to rock music, mm -hmm. um, and then when I listen to your music, when you have your uh, <clears throat> weekly uh, podcast where you where you play and stuff like that yeah it, it it's amazing it really is the the music your voice uh the songs it always puts me in a really good mood uh, good it, well yeah, thank it, you for saying that yeah it's really amazing it really is and i i suggest to everyone uh that's listening to this to check out ted's music because it it just gives this uplifting feel uh to your day. I mean, really, it, it, it really does. It's, it, you know, instead of being bombarded, you know, with the rock music that I listen to, uh, when I listen to yours, it, it, I, I walk away and I'm just like, yeah, hell yeah, man. I can, I can do whatever I want today. This is awesome. So good. You know, I'm really, I'm really, much. I'm glad you say that. And I'm honored. I definitely, uh, I definitely am a kind of a glasses half full type of optimist. And yep. in my, you know, in my songwriting, it's like life is not perfect. Right. We've always, always have have a, a heartbreak or uphill battles. Right. Uh, and and climbs. But some, some I, be I, I believe that one of the things that's magical about music is it can inspire us and help us to pull through. Absolutely. Usually, usually, even in my darker songs, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Right. Where there's a little bit of sun coming through the clouds in the corner. Right. Uh, and 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 also one of the things I've been doing for the last year and a half, of course, when we, uh, you know, for the quarantine, we, we no one could play live. You know, right. we just started. Uh, you know, I like I said, I live in L.A. So it's like just in the last three or four months have we really been starting to play live and do club gigs and do a little bit of touring. But mostly it's just drive to the club, drive home. That's it. You know, most right. of the traveling I've done has been one or two or three nights fly out and fly home, you know. Right. Uh, right. Uh, but and so one of the things I did is I started a series which used to be weekly uh, and it was like a Facebook live. I did it on on the Twitter live a few times or uh, Instagram live a few times. But I went with Facebook live because I thought the sound was a little better. Right. Uh, but I did it. I did this show called We're Going to Make It every Absolutely. week. And uh, I thought the world needed a little bit of optimism. I found there's a great old soul tune by Little Milton called we're gonna make it which i kind of wanted to cover for years it's just nice. a great kind of feel good almost like how sweet it is to be loved by you kind of a feel of the song right. you know he's a little right. grittier maybe but right uh so i was like i'm gonna learn that song and that's gonna be my theme song and close every show with it because nice. we're stuck at home and we have no idea what's going on in this world so let's yeah. we need a little bit of optimism let's, uh, was, let's almost really why I started this is because I know a lot of musicians, a lot of actors, actresses, and everybody involved in acting and music, um, engineers and makeup artists and, and so forth, um, who during the lockdowns and everything were getting uh, depressed and, you know, like they couldn't make it, uh, yeah. they couldn't make it past this hurdle 
And I just kind of wanted to talk to different people that have established themselves in the music industry and the acting industry that have, have made it and said, you know, we, we've also had hurdles in the past and we get through them. And all you need to do is just keep pushing uh, and uh, looking for the light at the end of the tunnel. And, you yeah. know, it's, it's totally. there. You just have to look closer to it. And the way I saw it is when you're, when you're in pitch black uh, or when, when you're in light, and all of a sudden all the lights are turned off. You can't see anything. And then it, creeping creeping out is this little light somewhere, you know, from underneath your, your door uh, or through your yeah. window or- Your through eyes your adjust. Door. Yeah, your eyes adjust. And that's, that's kind of what I wanted to do with this is to help people's eyes adjust to, hey, there is something out there and you just have to keep working for it and and towards it so um when you first started music uh tell us how that started how you got involved in it how your interest uh you know what what dawned on you one day and said yeah i think this is what i want to do and and talk about some of the hurdles or things that kept you from doing that and you said you know what I i'm i'm just going to do this and just keep pushing forward. Yeah. Well, I started I started playing trumpet in the fourth grade. Nice. And growing up in New York, everybody, you had to either start an instrument or join choir. And I was mortally afraid of singing. Right. <laughs> and uh, and so I chose the trumpet. Yeah, I and played in the school. Loved you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, thankfully, I wasn't I wasn't too big a kid, so I couldn't I didn't play that loud. Nice. Uh, but that that came over time. Uh, but I love I love the trumpet and I got really into my dad. My mom and my dad were both music lovers. They were also kind of pre Beatles people. They were not rock and roll people. So my dad and I always used to, you know, debate who was better, Frank Sinatra or Mel Torme. Oh, yeah. And we and uh, and he was in he loved the big band music. Right. Uh, so as I was like as a kid, I started joining these kind of after school bands that were like big bands and we would do like Glenn Miller songs and the Dorsey brothers songs and nice. Count Basie tunes. It was, it was great. Um, then when I was in high school, um, I got a bass guitar and I started joining rock bands and playing bass as well as trumpet. I still played trumpet in the school orchestra and stuff like that. Right. But um, <clears throat> I started playing bass and that's really kind of when it started clicking. It's like, Oh, this music, like when you do it with your friends, and it's like, it was, it was, you know, like I probably had a bass for about a month or two. And then I auditioned for my friend's band. And I was, oh, wow. I just remember being so scared. Yeah. Um, and it didn't, it didn't really occur to me that my friends were two guitars, keyboards and drums with no bass player. It right. didn't occur to me that they, they're not just going to let me in anyway. You know what I mean? <laughs> I totally thought, my God, I got to learn these songs. I remember having to learn birthday by the, by uh, the Beatles. Right. And we did maybe jump it was oh, nice. like one of the one of the david lee roth era songs right and i remember being like oh my god i love this van halen song and the bass part is so easy yeah. it's just one note at a time and you hang out there and then i remember i remember how difficult birthday was oh yeah because you know the, the guitars go na 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 but the bass keeps going Oh yeah. And I remember sitting in my living room practicing it and then having to like stop after 30 or 45 seconds and just kind of shake my hand out. And just playing that riff over and over was was oh, yeah. was was challenging. Anyway, so I got in the band. Um and then I I really uh just kind of passionately loved music. Uh then through college, I decided to not be a music major. Uh, and I was going to, I did English, oh, no. uh, and I was going to be, or actually the beginning of college, my dad wanted, he, you know, he, he like my dad wanted me to become a doctor and my sister to become a lawyer. He said, you, you gotta, you know, choose the successful industries and you'll make money and, and have a good life. You know, right. he just wanted for his kids, what he, you know, what was not able to do, you know? Sure. So I was pre-med for about a year and I just hated it. <laughs> and finally, I, I said to my mom, 
And my, I, I knew my mom would be supportive, but not my dad. I said, hey, I got to switch. Can I, can I try like do a couple English classes? I'm going crazy here. Right. Um, uh, and I, be, I believe my mom used to always tell me the quote was, my soul is dying. I said, oh, my no. soul is dying. <laughs> anyway, switched over to the English and philosophy route. But I was totally convinced that I couldn't be a musician for a living. Wow. My dad and my, my upbringing uh, my dad used to say, you're going to be broke. You're going to be miserable. You're going to be moving back in with me and your mother in a year and a half. Uh, so I was going to I was applying to grad schools to be a, to, to go to English literature grad school. I, was, I, yeah. I kind of wanted to be an English teacher or professor. Nice. Uh, and then about a month and a half before college ended, I just kind of said, I have to try. I have to try music because my my social life was entirely wrapped up in music. Right. Ever since ever since I started that first band in high school, I was in four or five different bands at any given time. Right. And all through college, I would have like the big band, the pit orchestra for like the Cole Porter show or whatever it was. And then I would be the musical director of one of these things. And then I'd be in my ska band and my rock band and my, you know, like my my classic rock, hard rock band. Right. And then the next year I'd be like, I'm I'm bored of ska now and I'll. I'll form a band that'll do like R.E.M. and Husker Du and uh, like like back then, what was college radio? Oh, yeah. Gangly, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, like replacements and kind of stuff. Yeah. And then that's I'd be like, I'm done with those guys. I'll start this. And so I always had a million bands going. Right. Uh, I had a I had a rehearsal of some kind almost every night. And then on the weekends, I would be in I'd have like a rehearsal and then a gig and then another gig. You know, and yeah. and so when I. I kind of decided, hey, if I if I don't give this a shot, my only it'll only because I'm afraid. Right. And I can't I I I knew I wouldn't forgive myself. Right. I let myself down. Right. So I told my parents, hey, I'm going to give I'm going to give it a year or two. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to move to Seattle uh, with my girlfriend and which I'd, I'd of course read a couple of magazine articles about how great the local music scene was. Of course, grunge was huge. Right. But I but I kind of knew I wasn't going to end up in Soundgarden or something. I, it was right. it was more about how active is the local scene. Right. And of course, with Pioneer Square and all these great pubs and uh, microbreweries and the, oh, the yeah. Red Hook Brewery and all this stuff like it was there was a lot of the local scene was very pumping aside right. from the, you know, uh, the, the 40 or 50 people directly associated with being in a famous grunge band. Right. You know? <laughs> uh, so we, I moved to Seattle. I said, if it doesn't work, I can always go to grad school. And right. I just I, I literally bought and I, I found an acoustic bass in uh, in the want ads for 600 bucks. So I drove to like Edmonds or somewhere like that to this guy's house and I bought it cash. And I did that within five or six days of being in Seattle. Um, my my girlfriend and I, we got an apartment and I said and thankfully rent was like 600 bucks or something like that right. so i was like if i find i remember thinking if i find six 50 gigs every month that's my half of the rent right there right i can right. totally do this right <laughs> and i started i started playing on the street i started answering ads in the paper yeah. um and going to blues jams there were a lot of these blues jams up in like uh pioneer square had a bunch and there are some others and like is it Lake Valley Way or West Valley? Like when you go northeast of Seattle, like you go to. Yeah, I, I don't. I stay away from that. Oh, OK. Anyway, there was, there was yeah. another area which was kind of a northeastern suburb, which had some uh, had a couple blues bars with blues right. bands. And so you'd go and you'd sign your name and then you'd wait all night because I was, of course, 21 years old and like, oh, yeah, the kid can't play. No. Oh, yeah. I'd watch all the professionals and all the amateurs play. And right. invariably, they'd let me they let me get on for the last two songs at one fifteen in the morning. Yeah. Guilt. <laughs> right. and, and if you were lucky, I was on stage because I'm the bass player. So if I, if I was lucky, I was on stage with a good drummer. Right. If there was a bad drummer. Then no matter what I'm doing, we're yeah. we're there's there's no feel and we're rushing and we're dragging. But everybody. But I started to get gigs. Through that. Nice. And I and I, I, I remember having one buddy. Uh, he was he was I, I never really had a mentor. I had a lot of people that I worked for that I would ask questions from and learn from, you know, right. but I never I didn't I didn't really have somebody who just took me under their wing and said, here we go. 
Right. But there was a great guy from up in Seattle who loved the blues. And uh, I remember him inviting me over to his house and we would we would listen to music for an hour and then drive to the gig together whenever oh, we could. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he's the one who said, hey, here's what's special about J.J. Kale. Here's what's special. Here's what, what Eric Clapton did to J.J. Kale's music. When someone says this is a Jimmy Reed groove, this is what it means. Right. And right, I started right. I start and uh, and I started really kind of getting into the details of it right. and learning. Right. Um, but I, I mean, I got to say those first those first years were hard. I was scrapping, doing every single job I could find. And sure. every single gig I could find, it was it, it it took many years for me to get to a point where I could I could start turning down stuff if I right. uh, if I didn't feel right about it, it you know, like right like it. it's like music. It, it's got to be really fun and musical or inspiring. Right. Or it's got to pay, got to pay well. And then I always have the, there's a there's a David Lynch factor. If it's going to be weird and fun and kind of strange, like, hey, we got a weekend in Bozeman. Uh-huh. I'm like, all right, I've never been to Bozeman. Let's go. Let's go. You know, <laughs> so I, I did a lot of I, I was like, if it was one of those four things. Right. Um, but but uh, but after a while, you can find me like, well, this band doesn't, uh, you know, like in terms of genre, I don't think I'm going to really enjoy this. Right. Maybe, but maybe if they're good friends, then it's OK. I'm there to support the cause. You right. Know what I mean? Right. Right. Um, but it took years before I was able to get more selective. And also, like when I when I moved to Seattle, my dad didn't talk to me Ooh. for a couple yeah. of years. Yeah, he yeah. was very hurt uh, and thought I was letting myself down and letting the family down and all that. Um, and so I, I was in Seattle, probably the early mid 90s through the 90s. And so we were definitely in the age of the CD right. rather than bands making vinyl and things like that. Right. And so for a while, I started freelancing and playing with all these different bands. Uh, and every time a band recorded and made a CD, I would send it to my dad. Oh, nice. And after about a year and a half, I'd sent him like 10 CDs. And after a while, he finally, you know, and of course, I'd get on the phone and talk to my mom. Right. And my dad would kind of say, oh, he can call me when he wants to. Like I hear him saying that's kind of yeah. from the background, like not getting on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> kind of just be, kind Tell of tough that damn kid to get a job <laughs> yes exactly but I, I was super specific i was like i will never borrow a dime from my parents right because uh, i don't want to i don't want that lingering i don't want them to perceive me as a failure uh and so after after like 10 or 12 cds over the course of a year or two he said who are all these people what are you what, what is all this i was like well in every major city there's a ton of great music we're not famous or we're not famous yet. Right. But these are people who are making a living and making music. Right. And some were jazz and some were rock and some were real singer songwriter. Uh, there was a great woman I played with who had this kind of a Tracy Chapman folk, but very groovy vibe. Uh, uh, and I was just I just wanted to know I'm doing a million gigs. and I'm actually beginning a career. Right. Uh, and and after about maybe after about two, two and a half years, my parents came out to visit me in Seattle Ooh. and I lived up in Capitol Hill and they came out for a week and I had a different gig. I believe six of the seven nights that they were oh, in town. Nice. Yeah, so they yeah. got to see me play a blues gig, a jazz gig, a rock gig, a reggae gig or something like that. And one of the last ones was me doing my own singer songwriter stuff. Oh, nice. Which at, the, which at the time was much jazzier. Yeah. I was coming out. Uh, like I was really into early Tom Waits. And so it was actually me on acoustic bass, a trumpet player and a drummer. And then I'd sing. Right. And so uh, it definitely had this jazziness to it. And my dad and I, I remember on after that gig, I went across and sat with my parents. And then my dad said, wow, you're really you're really good at this. Nice. nice. Like, like that was that was that was the week. Right. That when I won him over. Right. And, and, your, and, and your heart like, just your your heart. Yeah, he was like, "Wow, you're really it. talented. You're yeah. really doing this." Uh, yeah. You know, and he realized that my work ethic and all this other stuff, like I I need to apply it to the thing I'm passionate about. Right. Um, and it's like, and 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 even fast forward to like the quarantine, you were talking about kind of just surviving and right. how to stay alive and how to stay positive. Like when the when the bottom dropped out and I had no gigs. Thankfully, I had I, I had planned to produce a record. So I was going to 
uh, I was going to be in the studio a decent amount for that first next month of, of this last April. Right. Yeah, the first so at least weeks. some work, yeah. <laughs> but, but it was slowed down by the quarantine. We're doing zoom calls and sending people, sending each other like wave files of, of guitar tracks and vocal harmonies and stuff like that. Right. Um, and then after that, there was not a lot of work. Yeah. And so I, I would, I, I started doing zoom and FaceTime calls with songwriter buddies and be like, Hey, at least we can do is try to write something and connect. Right. Rather than right. sit at home and just stay depressed. Yeah. So I wrote, I started writing with different friends, maybe like a couple weekends or, or a couple, a couple of days a week. Yeah. Uh, like I'd have a writing session every Monday and every Thursday or something like that. Um, I started a, another group where we would write and then record the song that week by sending each other tracks. Right. Um, my wife has her office. She's a school teacher. And so she was upstairs in kind of our breakfast nook with her office. Right. Teaching. Right. Our son was in his bedroom and I was downstairs and I said, I just need to come downstairs to my studio every day. And whether I make my own music or do something else or write, yeah, I got to stay productive. Right. Because, because, because that, you know, with the quarantine, the first couple of weeks, I was, everyone was like, oh, this is going to be a nice little break. We'll be yeah. back at work. It's like, okay, let's just hang out and read and hang out with my, kid for a couple of weeks that'll be great right, right and then after two weeks kind of the day to come back to work kept getting pushed back right and then i went and then i was kind of like okay this is kind of cool it's like the semi-vacation i'll just hang in there yeah and then after a month or six weeks of it then i started getting really depressed it was like i have yeah. to do something oh yeah and and being creative kind of like for creativity's sake right is so important Right. And doing any kind of project I can right. to feel good about life. Right. Um, rather than just like sit around and you know, sit around in your bathrobe and watch more Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. How much Netflix can you watch? Yeah, so it was it was you know, it was nice. I ended up kind of working less than I would normally have worked. Right. But it was pretty. It was it was uh, I, I was one of the people that lucked out in terms of having a family that I was enjoying spending time with. Right. So I could go upstairs at five or five thirty and then not gig at all. Right. I was just home hanging out, making dinner with the family. And uh, uh, but it was hard. It was hard. I wrote a lot of songs, um, uh, a lot of a lot of half written things that never went anywhere. Right. I ended up releasing a record that I, I put out. A rec I put out my solitaire. The album is called Solitaire. And it was like all of those all of those tunes just sitting at home like i don't know there's no meaning in this i'm gonna so, put the links down below in the youtube okay so great people can get to the to the uh to the avenue to get the album or to listen to the album and all okay, your great. links and all your all your connection uh links will be underneath so everybody can get in touch with okay you. great but one of the things i was like the first four or five songs that ended up being for this album solitaire uh were all a downer they were all introspective. They were all like what, what we're going through. And then I realized after a bit, I was like, hey, we need some songs about escape right. or some songs about dreaming or right. some songs about looking ahead. Right. So I so I had a couple kind of half written older songs that kind of said the right sentiment. Right. So I, I revisited them and finished them. And so now I think Solitaire, it's like I think it's a it's a good, well-rounded record. There's Absolutely. an old, oh, yeah. But there's also it's it's also a very real, you know, we were a lot of us were struggling and in a dark place. Yeah. That's and exactly. I, I think a lot of musicians, they're the music that they've produced in the last year. I think a lot of musicians are in the same vein of what you just said. And it's weird because before COVID, uh, I was doing concert photography <clears throat> and was actually getting a good name doing concert photography. Yeah. And then concert stopped and i was like what 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 am i gonna do you know i mean uh, luckily i had other businesses that i was working with that weren't affected but as far as photography i was like i don't know what to do and i need to take pictures um it's my it's my artistic outlet so i opened up the studio and and was bum rushed by by everybody wanting to take pictures at the studio so that really helped the one thing that that uh when you were telling me about your dad 
uh, and the music. Uh, I don't remember which band member it was in Aerosmith, but they were getting the Lifetime Achievement Award mm -hmm. uh, and the band was up on stage. <clears throat> and I'm not sure who it was, but they, they took the microphone and said, Mom, Dad, if the music thing doesn't work out, I promise I'll go back to school. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> just cracking me up. I mean, they're That's getting a Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> it's it's one of the guys from Aerosmith. Really, really That's killer. <laughs> no, it's so very... Us, because go ahead. There, go ahead. There's not a... Uh, like for creative people in general, there's not a pre-established easy road that you can take. No. no. Uh, there's not. It's not like you get out of university and then, then they help find you a job. Right. Right. You know, now, granted, in most in most industries, it's not like that anymore. It's like right. when we were kids, you you know, there could be yeah, you know, you, some yeah. father down, down the street who work, who's been working at IBM for 35 years. Like right. even even now, that doesn't happen really anymore yeah, in, yeah. in those industries. But you really have to figure it out and you, oh, and yeah. you have to be driven to make it happen. Yeah. Um, and I and there were also many years like I feel like my life has been these kind of plateaus and. There, there, I mean, there are times when it's like two or three years of me kind of feeling like I'm depressed and I'm banging my head against the wall. Like I'm better than this. How right, come right. I can't get a better gig? Right. How come I like, I remember between 29 and 31 or 32. I, I, all my, all my buddies uh, out of all of us, you know, every, every few months, someone would give up music and be the yeah. expert at the stereo store or be a manager at guitar center. Right move 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 back to his hometown and whether it's the family business or i got a good job or i'm doing i'm, I'm gonna study real estate and how to sell right. real estate right um and it was just a hard one because when you're 28 29 30 it's like i was like okay i can't live on a thousand dollars or two or three thousand dollars a month like even if you work every night of the month and make a hundred dollars right that's a lot of gigging that's a lot of music yeah. Yep. And that's three thousand dollars. Yeah. So it's like you're still yeah. you're still kind of stuck at this, like you've got used furniture, you're scrapping by, right? You're maybe maybe a step above ramen noodles, right? <laughs> but but once you once you choose, like I remember being like, I don't want to live like a college kid anymore, right? I want to actually like have a have a have a you know like I, I I you know how many times have you had the situation where it's like you get your car repaired. And then the and then the mechanic says, "Well, you should really do this and this other thing, and this is going to go." And you're like, "Okay, I have three hundred dollars now. Right? Can you can you put these repairs in the order of importance? Right? And how long you think I have before right. the transmission goes? And then and then you're like, I got to bring the, the car back in because the thing is going to go. And the guy yeah. said I had I had <laughs> I had about three four months on the belt and all this. And it's it's like I was just like I I, I know I'm better than this. Right." Right. as a musician right but what what are the lessons i'm not learning and how, how why how am i somehow getting overlooked or shooting myself in the foot do i do i need to move to a bigger city um uh do i what what am i doing wrong and and often like that that feeling would come and it lingers for a year yeah. or two yeah. and and it's it's like there's no uh, and in the freelance world, I'm sure you've dealt with this with, with photography too. Like if you're doing something wrong, usually people just don't hire you again. Right. They don't tell you why. Right. They just yeah, stop it, calling yeah, you and they start, like, yeah. and then, and then you read, and, and especially now with Facebook, like you see that the band has another gig with another smiling bass player there. And you're like, oh, uh, well, what, what did I, what? <laughs> no one, you know, it, it's, it's hard to get the honest truth about what you did wrong. Right. You really have to be able to look yourself in the mirror and you're like, you think back about the conversations you had and what changed. Right. Or what did I do? Or like, was there a moment when I maybe said the wrong thing and offended? Yeah, exactly. Me or or yeah. proved that I wasn't cool enough. Yeah. Or, uh, you I know, think it's like all artists do that. I, I do it. I do it constantly. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think all artists do that where if they don't get hired or they don't, have that avenue open anymore they're like what did i do right. you know and like you said there's no way that you can call elton john and say 
was there a reason why you didn't hire me to do this or, you know, because right. we were getting along so well and how come you didn't do this and how, and I imagine that it's the same with musicians. Um, and then to add to that, you've got this lockdown that lasts a year and a half. So yeah. all these great musicians and great artists have given up and they said, I, I just can't do this. I, I have to pay rent. I have to go get a job. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think we're losing a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of art uh, and influencing people that should be out there making music yeah. or doing their art because of what happened. And, and one of the things that bothers me about this whole thing is that it's not being addressed. And the musicians and artists who are out there are getting very, very depressed and, and going to the permanent uh, solution um, instead of saying, okay, this is just temporary. We'll figure out something as we go. And once this ends, then we'll be able to do what we want to do again. And yeah. I think that we're losing a tremendous amount of, of artistic people, uh, from, from all of this. And this, yeah. is, this is my hope, uh, in this is to let these people know that it's going to end and just it's keep end and we, forward. and we need your art and you're, and you are yeah. making your own art is one of the things that's going to keep you sane and happy. What right. I'm, and, I, and I've noticed too, um, among my extended group of friends in LA and around and around the country, <laughs> you know, a lot of people are, are, you know, there's a, their parents are having health issues or whatever they, but they're leaving, they're leaving town and, and finding a way to be happier. Right. With a, with an, with, with what is an easier life and, or a less artistic life. Cause you don't right. have to worry about the risk or the crazy people in your band you have to deal with all the time or whatever. Um, <laughs> But I'm hoping that a lot of these people will be drawn back to it. Like once the waters get a little safer and, you know, like, you know, like I'm actually booking a, a tour, uh, a solo tour. I'm going to go to Europe in February. Oh, three awesome. And I'm like, I'm talking to my booking agent and my friends in Finland. Like there was literally the government in fi of Finland that said, you, no one can book any gigs. Ooh. We can't even, you know, stop guessing yeah. when this is going to end. No gigs. And so it's like, I want to go to Finland and play. I love, I, I've got some great friends in Helsinki and da, 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 da. it's always a high point for me. Right. Um, and, and I, I'm just hoping that in the next three or four months, it'll be okay. And it's like, it's, it's really hard. I know a lot right. of, you know, I'm sure we've all seen in the news as well and heard that certain bands are out there traveling, certain bands are out there trying to tour and canceling shows. Yep. Like creating controversy. Like the last thing, the last and like, it's so hard to find an audience that loves your music. And then you, when you finally can get out and play for them, the last thing you need is to have some like controversial or political decision about, right. yeah, exactly. about why you have to cancel the show or not, or, yeah uh it's it's a it's a rough time and, right. and i and I, i'll stand with you and try to encourage the artists and musicians that are having a harder time now it's like we need good. you yeah that's, yeah. that's why that yeah. we need we, we we can band together as much as we can good 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 yeah if you know anybody that wants to do this uh just let them know or let me know and and we'll okay great each other and stuff like that um i wanted to end with a light uh a light spot uh, okay. the light at the end of the tunnel. So I want you to tell me one of the funniest stories that you can about being on the road and, and what happened and, and let me, let us, let us hear this story. Uh, what's a, what's a good one. You know, I'm thinking of a silly one. Uh, <clears throat> actually I'll give you a really cool one. Cause one of the, one of the, we, we met fairly recently, right. right. Just a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, we came up to play Seattle, uh, basically Shooter Jennings, who I've been playing with forever, produced the new Duff McKagan album a nice. couple years ago. Yep. So we came to Seattle to play with Duff. We played the Showbox. Yep. And then a few months later, we came back to Seattle to play the Tractor with Shooter. And that's where I was. And I, and I was the opening act that night. And that's kind of the night where you and I bonded and met. Yep. Um, so. Basically, the, the Duff record is called Tenderness. It's really, really good, really wonderful. 
uh, soulful music. Right. And it was a real honor to be able to hang out with Duff and work with him. And uh, and then, of course, he's the singer and guitar player in the band. So right, right. I wasn't on the album. It's the rest of Shooter and the, and the rest of the band that was on the album. Duff, right. of course, imagine Duff McKagan wanted to play bass on his own album. You right. Know? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, so, uh, but but I got to learn all the parts yeah. and then really kind of I really took it seriously and, and uh, uh, you know, showed up for rehearsal and right. then had a and then and then it was a pretty awesome trip. And a little stress inducing in the, in the early moments of it, yeah. of like, oh, my God, now I'm the bass player in Duff's band. This is nuts. <laughs> right. But but we kind of bond and we talk and joke around. Uh, and then the music in general was very consistent and really, really good, really wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Duff really sets a tone for, OK, we're going to make magic tonight. Right. As, as well as we can. You know? Right. And of course, we are we all want to we all want to do that anyway. Right, right, he, right. There, it's the, the 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 level gets even higher, you know. Yeah. And so, it was one of our last days, and we're in Milan, on tour. Right. We did three weeks in the U.S. and then three weeks in Europe. Okay. So our final gig is in Milan, and then, uh, I think we're driving on the bus to Milan. So it's a couple days before the end of the tour, and you know how you on the tour bus sometimes everyone takes turns, uh, DJing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Right. So, so Duff Duff has an old buddy named McBob, who's like uh, oh, one yeah, of the yeah. main crew guys for Guns N' Roses for like 30 years. Right. Right. So so when Duff does the solo tour, of course, it's not it's not a crew of 50 or 80 or who knows. But but McBob comes with him. So right. he's got Duff, Duff's got his guy and they're, you know, uh, and so McBob uh, starts DJing and he plays uh, if he played what is hip by Tower of Power. Nice. And so Duff and I are sitting there across from each other and we're like, this is unbelievable. Who's this on the bass? And I was like, well, that's Rocco Presti. He was in Tower of Power, you know, because like it's super melodic and crazy, you know? Right. And I've, I'd have i kind of sat down to try to learn it years ago and probably got pretty close. I'm like, all right, that's cool. I'm never, I'm right. never gonna actually do that in real life. But, right. but I, got, I got the gist. And Duff is like, what? What is going on? It's like, I used to know this song. He's like, hey, come to my hotel room tomorrow. Let's work on it. Oh. And so and so we get there. We start figuring it out and playing it over and over and over, you know, on uh, on iTunes or whatever. And I'm like, oh, no, here's, here's what he's doing and getting close. And Duff is, of course, not a music school guy, but he's got a great ear and a right. great feel for music. You know what I mean? Right. And so we ended up kind of like giving we kind of gave each other bass lessons while we were watching each other do the things we're great at right and it was pretty awesome and he's like dude you just gave me a bass lesson that's awesome <laughs> it's not a it's not a it's not a funny crazy one but it was a pretty awesome thing to have our final day on tour in europe in right like, in, a, in this really nice hotel room in the middle of milan oh yeah be like all right I'm gonna, I'm gonna i'm gonna i'm uh, gonna trade bass lessons with duff right yeah so that's it was pretty, it was pretty yeah. wonderful and and it you know it's like it it kind of leveled the playing field in a way because right was, i was yeah. showing him certain things and he was showing me certain things yeah i i, I couldn't imagine like for me if, if if mark mann and i got together and we're sitting there talking about editing and stuff like that i would be beside myself like yeah, oh my yeah. god you know I'm, I'm sitting there editing photographs with mark mann i i would be blown away and that yeah, would yeah. give me a high that would last for months so no it was yeah, wonderful I, it was really it was really wonderful yeah i bet well thank you very very much for coming on ted and i really appreciate you and love you and uh when you come back to seattle we're gonna have to go back to that pub again because we're gonna have to show up where we can eat this time you got uh, it and go down <laughs> so but yeah thank you very much and i'm gonna put all the links uh, to get in touch with Ted uh, underneath the YouTube uh, video. Uh, but please listen to him. He's awesome guy. He's, he's just very, very uplifting, very musically uh, talented. Uh, and I, I think everybody who doesn't know Ted that will listen to Ted, it will just be completely blown away and uplifted. It, it's just a, it's a wonderful music that you produce and put out and i really thank you very you much on. Thanks yep. for and uh, uh take care of yourself and when you come back to seattle let us know and uh, we'll get together and 
and go out for coffee or something. Go you got it. There. You got All it. All right. Thanks, Love bud. Yep. Thank you. Have a good one. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. All right.